Uh, welcome back. Um, just in case, uh, two two things. Uh, please turn off non-essential Wi-Fi devices. It's probably been said a couple of times, but uh, just to remind you. And also, if you haven't picked up your dinner tickets yet, now would be a good time to do it, or actually after the talk. Um, because if you don't have them, you won't be able to come to dinner tonight. And it was very, very fun last year, so I'm sure the same will be tonight. Um, our next presenter is a senior Python developer and technical lead for Catalyst IT, New Zealand's largest company specialising in open source. In his spare time, he is a photographer and guitar player, but today he'll be talking about using Scython for reasons. Please make Tom Eastman welcome. Hi. Um, before we get too started, I just want to make sure I didn't give everyone the wrong idea. There's not actually any super hard magical crypto in my talk. Um, it would be great if there was, but this is just kind of some passing whimsy that I had some fun with. Um, so glad you're all here. But if you are here, watch the videos of the other talks later because they both look a lot more interesting or a lot more useful. Um, yesterday, I gave a talk at DjangoCon, which was about my day job, which was Django development and Python development in general. This talk is not about my day job. This talk is about procrastination and the sorts of things that can happen when you're procrastinating. Um, I started at Catalyst IT about 18 months ago, and I was hired as a Python dev, but a few months after I started, the, the project that I was hired for got cancelled. So I was kind of a square peg looking for round holes to go in, and I ended up on a Perl development team and a JavaScript development team for a while, which was still a lot of fun, and I learned an awful lot, but I wasn't really doing the Python, which is what I really enjoy doing. Um, and so I found myself doing it more in my spare time. Uh, at Catalyst, we use a lot of, well, we use all open source gear, but we, we use a lot of you know, reasonably common open source tools. We have a wiki, an internal wiki. We have an internal IRC server. We have an internal Alfresco server, et cetera. We also have an internal paste bin, which we use a lot on the IRC server. Um, I'm just going to show you an instance of it briefly, because the context is important. It's a really simple script written by a former colleague of mine. It's a Perl script running on an Apache server, which just you know takes your paste. It has a ton of syntax highlighting, and you paste it, and you get a, and a, with a URL that you can just use in your IRC conversation that you're having with your, with your coworkers or whatever. Um, it is taking an MD5 sum of the thing that you pasted and using that to generate the URL, which is actually really handy because if you're pasting the same thing in multiple times, that ends up with the same URL, which is kind of handy. Um, uh, let me just get that full screen again. Okay. So early, about a week after I got there, I wrote a script that just helped you pipe commands directly from the shell into the paste bin, um, which was quite handy if you were debugging an error or something and you wanted to show who you, the people you were working with. You could pipe it directly in and you would just get the URL out. Um, and the script was pretty straightforward. It was actually, that's all comment story. Um, where's my mouse pointer? Um, it was really just an excuse to learn curl as well, because I hadn't really done much curl. But I wrote this and I put it in the paste bin. And I had this idea that I really wanted the URL that I had in my comment there to actually match the one that was right here. But, <laughs> but there was no way to do that, right? Because if, as soon as I changed the comment down here to match that, and then I paste it in, and then the URL is different, because the MD5 sum doesn't match. Um, so yeah, that was just a useful thing. And that's not procrastination. That's a useful tool. I, I, I gave that to my colleagues, right? So <laughs> for some reason, this idea popped in my head, and I have no idea why. But I thought it would be fun to just you know, start a story in the paste bin. And it was like, if you want to turn left at the winding path, you would go to this URL. Or if you wanted to turn right, you would go to another URL. It just seemed like a fun thing to do. Someone had already done something similar on the wiki. There was like an adventure on the wiki. You are in the Catalyst foyer. Do you wish to go to level seven? So on and so forth. But nobody was doing that on the paste bin. And you know, why not? 
Um, and the answer is because it's hard because it's taking an MD5 sum of your, of your paste. And so as soon as you try and change that to update a link, the links will change. And how do you do that? Um, by posting them in reverse order. So you write your story and you post the, the V end page and then you know what its URL is. And so you update the links of your other pastes and you paste, and you paste them in with the updated links and then you know what their URLs are. So I decided I was going to write a script that would post basically an acyclic directed graph into the paste bin which would update the links as it went through in reverse order and then real life got in the way. Six months later, you know, I actually do have a day job so I can't blow all my time on this sort of thing. Um, but I kept coming back to that paste script and wanting to make the URL match what I wanted it to be. Because um, the problem with the adventure story is it had to be an acyclic graph. I couldn't, um, I, I couldn't put a cycle in. Like I couldn't go make them go back to the start or anything like that because of the problem of having to be able to predict your MD5 sums. I'm not smart enough to know how to crack MD5 sums. It's, people say that the algorithm is broken, but it's broken for smarter people than me. Uh, so I just brute forced them. How hard can it be, right? Um, let's talk about Cython for a minute. <laughs> Cython, who's used, who's used Cython? Cool, lots of you. For those who haven't used Cython, it's, it's many things, but the simplest way to describe it is it'll compile something that looks, that, that either is Python or looks like Python to C, uh, specifically to a C Python extension, which you can then import in your Python. Um, so it's a really easy way to get a, a speed boost in your code. Um, these code snippets are just taken directly from the Cython documentation, but if you have a function that's vaguely mathematical and reasonably straightforward like that, that's, that's pure Python right there. Cython is, I guess you could call it a dialect of Python, and it's Python with C types. So now you have type checking, you have, you have static typing on your arguments and on your variable declarations. And if you do that, then the Cython compiler can basically take that function and instead of it being a Python C function which takes Python objects and manipulates them, it can squeeze it down into basically pure C. So it's, you can almost write C without having to know C, which is a bonus in anyone's book because I haven't had to write C in a long time, but um, I still hate it. Um, if you just use Cython on a simple example like that, which is using just pure Python objects, like s equals zero there is still a Python object which is an integer as opposed to a C integer, you'll get, according to the documentation, something like a 30% speed up just because it's compiled. But if you do full typing, you can end up with a good 100 or 150 times speed increase. So I decided to use this little side project as an excuse to learn some Cython and try to squeeze as much speed as I could out of my code or as much slowdown out of my code without having to, uh, without having to concentrate really. So how do you get the MD5 sum you want with the file you've got? You take the file you've got, you grab its MD5 sum, you copy the MD5 sum object, throw something a little bit extra at the bottom of the file and add that to your MD5. In this case, I'm just taking an integer and I'm just tagging the bottom of the file with an integer and I'm just, so basically it's, you know, blah, 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 one. What's its MD5 sum? Blah, 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 two. What's its MD5 sum? If you do that enough times, eventually it's going to collide, right? Now, if you have to, if you have to, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you might have noticed from the uh, paste bin, I don't have to match a full MD5 sum. A full MD5 sum is two to the power of 128. It's 128 bits long. That would take a lot of guesses. The URLs are only six digits long. That's two to the power of 24, which is 16 million guesses. A modern CPU can eat 16 million tries for breakfast. 
um, it worked. I could basically set the, MD5, the last six digits of the MD5 sum to whatever I wanted it to be, um, which was kind of cool. I didn't realize. It only took about 10 minutes of processing. So for each page, 10 minutes of number crunching, millions and millions of tries, you could generate whatever you wanted. Um, there was just two things that I didn't really like about it. One is that it was taking 10 minutes, and that just, eh, I wanted to speed that up a little more. Um, and the other one was it meant that all of my files had a big chunk of gibberish at the bottom of the file. Um, and if I was going to do this, I didn't want to make it too obvious how I had done it. If people just saw gibberish at the bottom of the file, they'd probably start, you know, asking questions. Um, I just covered that. So, my computer, standard desktop box, it, standard desktop box has eight cores these days. How cool is that? Um, <laughs> how do I use them? I personally don't know a thing about multi-threaded programming. It's something that I've managed to avoid most of my life. I tend to do scripty things. I tend to do Django-y things where the requests are handled in different threads anyway. The, the worst you need to know is about maybe thread local stuff if you're trying to do weird storage. Um, and also, in Python, you kind of are told to shy away from threading because of the global interpreter lock and something like that. This is me not understanding the problem. <laughs> I, I, don't really get, I don't really get threaded programming or why it's problematic. So Python also is really cool because it lets you skip the problem. Um, yeah, I had to do it anyway because this MD5 something is massively parallelizable, right? So if I'm not using all eight cores, why am I even bothering? So in Python, you can use the multiprocessing module. Who's familiar with that? Excellent. For those who aren't, um, it works just like threading, except it's not threading. It's actually forking off multiple processes of your file. Um, now, if I understand correctly, that completely avoids the problem that people are talking about with the Pythons and the Gills and, and, and whatever. Um, but this just calls the function I showed you before, but it sets up a pool of eight workers. Um, and the first one is trying integers 0, 8, 16, 24. The next one is trying 1, 9, 17, 25. This is me doing math. Um, <laughs> Suddenly, I've farmed it out to eight cores. And it worked really, really well. That actually, once you've got Cython there, I'm not really managing to take much advantage of Cython. I think I'm getting a, a, a some speed up, like the 30% that they were talking about, as opposed to the 100 times, mainly because I was using Python's MD5 sum library. Uh, if I was using a native C1, maybe it would have been a ton faster. I haven't looked at the implementation of the library, I didn't need to, because now it takes anywhere from between three seconds and 30 seconds to c cause an MD5 sum collision in anything I want, um, up to you know the six digits. Seven takes a lot longer, and eight, it might as well give up, or just start doing this in GPUs. Then yeah, you can just do whatever you want. Um, Cool, so I've got it fast enough to make me happy. You know, it, it takes, literally sometimes it takes like two seconds to generate a collision. MD5 sums are broken. Um, so how do I hide the gibberish at the bottom of my file? Because that's kind of the last thing. It's just sitting there, it's ugly. I just wish that it wasn't there. Um, so it, I, I'm just using an integer and just counting up, right? Um, so at the bottom of my file, I'm trying one, I'm trying two, I'm trying three, I'm trying four. Now I could map that, I could map those things that I'm trying to some other character set. I could map it to letters. I could just be trying combinations of letters until I get to the right spot. Um, I thought of maybe just trying words and I'd have a few random words at the bottom and I would just, and then I thought of trying grammatically, doing, doing grammatically correct syntax uh, sentence generation of words, so there would just be like a nonsense sentence down the bottom just to confuse people any further. And then I realized that actually there's a much easier thing to do. <laughs> the ASCII character set gives you five white space characters, um, which is more than you usually think. You think you've got spaces and carriage returns, 
But what you've actually got is space, tab, carriage return, line feed, and vertical tab. I don't even know what a vertical tab is. Does anyone here know? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Okay. I have no idea what a vertical tab is. Uh, but it's slash F, apparently, if you want to try printing one. Um, so what you do is you take your integer and you convert it basically to base 5. And instead of that base 5 being Roman numerals, you use a little vocabulary of your space and your tab and your, and, and your new line carriage return and slash F, the mysterious slash F. And suddenly what you've got is at the bottom of all, your, all of your files, a little chunk of random white space that doesn't show up in the web browser at all, which is great. <laughs> and then real life got in the way again. Uh, I had all the code, and I just had to sit there and actually make the maze. I had to, I had to, it, it started off as an adventure story, but that required a lot more creativity than I had, so I just decided to make a, a, a labyrinth. Um, and the reason it took 14 months here is, who here is one of those people who has written the code for their blog more times than they've written blog entries? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Jacob, isn't that how Django started? Um, but 14 months later, under the impetus of uh, actually having to get this deployed because I was giving a talk on it at a conference, um, this showed up in the paste bin one day. Let's see if I can make this work. And it just had a thing. And that just had a thing. And that just had a thing. Actually, in the paste bin itself, the, li the links weren't clickable. So this, this was kind of tedious for people pretty fast. Especially when they got to this point <laughs> and realized that they had a long way to go. Now, the hardest part of this was actually coming up with enough lousy movie references to keep people entertained as they kind of went through. That was a dead end. It takes you back to the start. See, cycles. Cycles are useful. You go down here. Oh, that's another dead end. Um, yeah. My originality didn't work out terribly well when it comes to actually determining. That's an Edgar Allan Poe quote, actually. But I was just trying to find weird things to put into places. Anyway, it actually ended up being quite convoluted. Oh, we're back to the start again. Um, and I posted it reasonably anonymously on the IRC server, and people looked at it, clicked around on it, and what? And this being an open source company and a lot of techies wrote a script to scrape all the links, <laughs> built a dot graph of it. <laughs> And then, and then they, went, they went on with their day. <laughs> Nobody cared after this. They considered it a solved problem. What, so I actually, I actually had to anonymously kind of ping them again and go, actually, the solution, the end of the maze, is not in that. It's not linked to by any of the others. You have to read all the clues and piece it together to find the URL for the end of the maze. So in the end, uh, one person found their way through my maze, and I'll just say a shout out to Aaron Wells, who doesn't yet know that I actually did this, but he's actually waiting for the prize, um, which I'll have to deliver to him when he gets, when I get home. Um, so, in the end, this was a talk about procrastination, <laughs> um, but there's a couple of useful lessons that you can take away from it. And the first one is, if you are going to procrastinate, use it to learn something new. Try out some new things and find some new cool toys to play with that might help you in your actual real life job. And then also use your constraints to learn something new. The whole, the whole fun of this was, this was not something that should have been easily doable, but I had to end up doing some weird things to make it work. And I learned a lot from it. And it was far more fun than it should have been. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, 
thank you, Tom. Um, if you've got any questions for Tom, um, just see him. Come, come and see me afterwards after if you want talk, to ask those yeah. things. Uh, and as reward for your um, Byzantine plans, uh, there is some uh, Norwegian blue coffee and a coffee mug. Maybe I'll share this with Aaron. Uh, yeah. Actually, idea. maybe I won't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, Thank and you. And I think that's it. And just for a lark, I took, so I took, you know, plain Python code and sizened it, and then I did the, all of the marking up of the types and sizened it, and I got like, you know, 100 times speed up, and that's all fun. And then for a lark, I ran the original Python code in PyPy mm. and got 100 times speed up. Is that right? So I was just wondering whether you've played with PyPy. You know, I'm actually, I'm actually to yet to. I, I keep hearing about PyPy, and I really mean to play with it, and I haven't gotten around to it yet, but that's good incentive to. In the end, I didn't play around with Cython as much as I thought I would, because it ended up being far easier than I thought it would be to generate MD5 sum collisions. Um, again, six-digit ones. Uh, it would have been a lot harder. Uh, just, just adding a couple more digits would have made this infeasible on anything other than a GPU core. I suspect as soon as you start doing GPU programming these days, you could do it with the whole MD5, and it would just be minutes. Uh, but again, I know how to do Python better. <laughs> Uh, this isn't a question, but FYI for all you young kids, um, backslash F is form feed, um, uh -huh. which gave you a new page um, when we had printers. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those. Oh, I, remember. Um, I, I stand corrected. It's not there, a vertical tab. There is, a, there is a vertical tab. That's backslash V, which is like every ah. eight lines. So okay. There was yeah. So there's another one there for you to use. Mm. The uh, incidentally, actually, I can probably the 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 chunk of text that you ended up uh, appending to the file only ended up being about ten characters long in base five. It, it was anywhere from like. 10 to 15 characters long, usually. I got a question. Uh, in the multiprocessing, if one of your cores finds the answer within half a millisecond, the other ones are still churning through, can you sort of tell them, I've got it, let's stop now? Actually, yeah, let me show you, let me show you that code again. I think there was, there was an annoying problem there, which was, uh, oh, did I? No, do, 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 sorry. That one. Let me see. Oh, you know, I might have cut some of the code out to uh, fit it on the slide, but that finish value there is a um, multiprocessing. It's basically a semaphore variable. It's all, all of the threat. All of the processes have access to that variable. Uh, but it's and so when when one of them found the answer, it would store it in that variable. But looking, at, looking up that variable is very, very slow. So what I'm actually doing is, as soon as one of the processes finds the correct answer, it's storing it in that variable and it's exiting. But all the other processes are only checking for a value in there every million runs or so, or every 500,000 runs, because that just means that they'll stop after a second or two. Um, but checking it on every loop of that tight for loop um, slowed things down immensely. And I didn't mind if it ran a few seconds over uh, if they were doing work when the other one had already found the answer. In the interests of optimizing what doesn't need optimizing, mm. if you're adding to the end of the MD5, because it's a streaming type um, algorithm, you could pre-calculate everything up to the end. That's exactly what I'm doing. Um, oh, didn't look close enough. The copy, the hash copy there, is, and then I'm just, um, I have two of those MD5 sum hashing objects, and I'm just rewinding back to that one every time. Which was why, which was why the uh, thing had to end up at the end of the file. Like, it, my first experiment was uh, just putting it somewhere randomly in the file, middle of the file using Python string interpolation, and I figured that I could somehow incorporate whatever the random number was into the file to make it innocuous. Um, but that was also very, very slow. But just tagging things onto the end was nice and fast. Again, in the interest of optimizing things that don't need it, 
you're not checking to see whether you've already got a valid value before you push another valid value in there? <laughs> uh, I am at the start of the run. So if the MD5 sum already matches, it doesn't do anything. Because I was, when I was generating the maze, the, the, the maze is generated by a script as well. Um, but I have made it so that it was only patching the files if they needed to be patched. And the first thing it would do is strip the trailing white space off of the, uh, off of the file, and then just start tagging it on. Um, any other questions? Well, Can that, someone come up with some practical use for any of this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> it just proves that geeks are really, really interested in very esoteric... Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Just as, a, uh, just as a coda, we have now patched the paste bin so that I can't do this anymore. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, that's unfair. Well, I know, but, but it was... yeah. Um, <laughs> Although, it, we might have just made it harder, because what we've done is we've just added a salt to what's being MD5'd. So that URL is now no longer something that you can easily brute force offline, because you don't know the salt that the server is using. Um, for those of us who are curious, did your paste bin check whether or not an entry existed before you inserted it? No. So you could use this to replace someone else's entries? I would not do that. <laughs> But because of that, is one of the, that's one of the reasons why, after I played around with this, we've, we decided to patch the paste bin just to make sure that no one could use it for evil. <laughs> I think this is more questions than we have ever got in any of the other talks. <laughs> no it's one a, said why. It's okay, it's not a question. Look up hash extension attacks. Yes, actually, um, my, one of my colleagues was mentioning that to me later. Um, I don't know much about it, but we were talking about... That was a reason why, when we were discussing trying to use a salt to, to fix it, that maybe that wouldn't be enough. Um, but I don't, I don't understand the attack well enough. Maybe I need to use bcrypt. Maybe we, maybe we need to use bcrypt to generate the URLs. Right. <laughs> it is, however, a paste bin. <laughs> Just saying, might be overkill. Um, anyway, thanks again. Uh, round of Thank applause. You.